All right, the, the next speaker is uh, Pablo Spreshman. Uh, so Pablo uh, got his um, master's in Uruguay and then his PhD from University of Minnesota. Uh, he went on to do a postdoc at Duke and uh, he's currently a postdoc with uh, Yann LeCun at uh, NYU. Um, he's going to be uh, talking today about deep learning for solving inverse problems. Uh, and uh, let's welcome him. Uh, hi, hello, thank you for the introduction and thanks again uh, to the organizers for having me here. Uh, so, I will, uh, while we solve the, these technical issues, uh, I will comment that I will be talking about work that I did with Alex, Alex Bronstein, Guillermo Sapiro, as well as uh, the latest one with Joan Bruna and Jan Lecon. So, okay, this talk will be about solving inverse problems, and I will start by giving just a very quick overview about what do I mean with inverse problems. So, the, the forward problem would be when we have a cer certain signal, the process in which we generate some uh, samples from it. And the idea is that uh, the, the inverse problem is to go uh, on, the other, on, on the inverse direction in, in that arrow. So the topic I will be, the, the problem I will be, be dedicating the most time on, it will be source separation where our observations is a mixture signal and we want to separate, separate them. Another example could be image super resolution where we have a very low resolution image and we want to produce a high quality one. And just to go one dimensional higher, uh, another example of this would be, let's say, some tomography in which we get some corrupted 2D uh, measurements of a volume that we are interested in observing. So uh, just to be a, a slightly more formal, the idea is that we want to reconstruct a certain signal X from some incomplete uh, or indirect measurements Y, and we have a function gamma that would be the function that gives us the measurements. And in, in general, the space in which the measurements lives is of smaller dimensionality of the, that of the signal, or uh, the measurements are uh, highly corrupted. So these problems are in generally in general in ill posed, uh, meaning that we have infinitely many possible solutions that we would match our observations. So I will be talking about two approaches that received a lot of attention in in the last uh, ten or fifteen years, and this is uh, model based approaches and uh, deep learning. That I will concentrate most of the talk on that. So just a quick word on model based approaches. Uh, the, the idea is that they want, they try to find the, some meaningful uh, solutions out of these ill-posed problems by uh, promoting certain structure here through this function f, and they solve optimization problems uh, of, of this form where we want to have uh, a lot of structure, so this means a low value of f uh, that is, uh, for our signal such that is consistent with the observations. And a uh, type of structures could be uh, sparsity, no negativity, and so on. And we could have as well uh, noise in the measurements, so we would be measuring something like this. So deep learning, after all these talks, and all well, <laughs> and in particular to this audience, I don't need to be saying too much about it. So, but, but essentially, the, we are trying to learn hierarchies of features uh, using these powerful fun functions, like this con convolutional neural network there. And it, it has a huge success initially in the second wave of success of neural networks in a classification tasks. But more recently, uh, deep learning has been used for structure prediction, meaning that the output that we want is no longer just a label, but a certain thing with structure, like the post estimation uh, work there, or even more wilder cases such as uh, image captioning, where uh, we want to get a, this, a text describing an image based only in the visual con content of the image. So uh, inverse problems is a particular case of, case of structure prediction in which we want to predict a certain uh, signal which has a, a structure. And it's tempting to use deep learning it, 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 since we, in many cases we can have access to pairs of observations and measurements. Uh, and we can treat this problem simply as a, as a regression problem. So uh, I will, the outline of the talk will be as follows. I, I will concentrate most of the talk in audio source separation. And I will start by describing uh, very briefly, I mean, after all these talks, uh, what non-negative major factorization is. 
And uh, what I will concentrate is sort of relates to my personal path in, in this uh, research, it, and is how there's a natural way for, for going from these model-based approaches to the deep learning uh, setting. And at the end of, of, of that path, I will review the techniques that have been proposed by many uh, works in the literature for using deep learning for this type of problems. And then I will propose the new method in which we were working uh, last year with Jean Bruna and Jan Lecun. And we are, uh, I'm going to talk in particular about how to use multi-scale stable representations and how solving inverse problems can benefit from that. And with the, the ideas that I will use there, I will discuss how they could be used in other inverse problems, potentially more challenging ones. So source separation, everybody knows. We have, a, 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 just to say that it's a single channel case, and I will be considering two sources, and, uh, but, but it can be generalized to more. And uh, although, as we saw in the last talk, this is very hard, and uh, I would assume this fully supervised case in which we have uh, available training data for the class of signals that both sources belong. And the applications are speech to speech or speech enhancement or other applications in, in music. So, well, NMF, we know, we, 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 we all know, probably know it here. We have the at time frequency representations like the modulus of the uh, short time Fourier transform. We train dictionaries for each of them and we model uh, the signals such as the different frames can be well uh, represented as uh, non-negative non linear combinations of dictionaries. And the way this is solved in practice is by solving a cost that resembles the model-based approaches that I discussed before, in which the transformed version of the signal uh, is decomposed uh, using a dictionary that has two components, one for each source. And we can do this because in the time frequency representations, signals in general are incoherent, so this approximation holds. So D is a fitting term, the, the usual ones, divergences or Euclidean uh, uh, norm. And the Psi is a regularizer that could impose sparsity or other type of structure. So the thing is that after we perform the separation, we need to recover the signals. And this is a phase recovery problem that, as was discussed in the previous talk, uh, is efficiently solved using these maskings. And uh, this Wiener filter-like type of maskings has the nice property that they ensure, for example, that the both signals adapt to the original signal, which has to do uh, with the structure in the problem. So I will come back to this later. So let me now go and, and uh, review what would be a natural way of coming from these model-based approaches to uh, the deep, general deep learning settings. And the first observation is that if we are in the super, fully supervised case, uh, we are sort of um, misusing the available training data that we have in the sense that, so if we train dictionaries independently, like in the top row here, for each sources, and then we combine them, and uh, let's say we hope that the, the composition will take each source to the correct side of the dictionary, uh, is there's a mismatch between the objective we use at training and the, the one we use at testing. So uh, it feels that we could do better because uh, if the signals are incoherent, this will work, but might not always be the case. And we saw failing uh, in the challenging settings this approach uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, the idea is to, uh, one idea is the discriminative version of non-negative matrix factorizations in which I worked uh, as, as well as other groups. And the idea is to state the problem as a bi-level optimization problem in which we train the dictionaries such that the codes that we obtain, so we generate artificial mixtures and we train the dictionaries such that when we solve the problem that we face at testing, those uh, codes will uh, reconstruct each individual signal. And this is called a bi-level optimization problem as the uh, the, the problem, the optimization problem on the top depends on the optimization problem of the bottom. But uh, so while this works better if we have enough training data than the previous approach, it suffers from uh, the problem that this is a synthesis operator. So the dictionary learning is a synthesis operator which has the nice property of pulling things apart. And this is in part why it works. Because if we observe two things that in the input space look alike, the, the synthesis operator will pull them apart and then we can identify them. 
But the thing is that as the dictionary grows, and let's say if we have sparsity, the active sets become unstable. So then taming this unstable operator can become hard. So a natural way to give the next step toward deep learning in this uh, setting would be uh, try to change the synthesis operator for an analysis operator that either approximates it or is inspired on it. And the idea here is to say, OK, the key observation is un under certain conditions when we are solving these model-based approaches. What we actually do is we have an initial signal, and we run an optimization uh, process for solving it. So even this, if this process is hard to compute, we have a, a, a mapping here. And the idea is that we can think of it in the terminology of the autoencoders, where we have a, an, a, a pair encoder-decoder that map the signal into the signal, going through a meaningful stage, so to, to avoid having just an identity that copies the, the signals. And in this setting, the encoder would be a complicated iterative procedure, and the decoder would be just a linear uh, operator. So the idea of using NMF-inspired uh, deep net, net, uh, learning architecture essentially works as well. And in the previous talk, it was a, a more general version of this was mentioned. The idea is that we unroll the iterations of this algorithm. We fixed the number. Uh, we fix it to a certain number. So if we follow this path, we will advance a little bit in the optimization of the of the loss. But the key point is that. Instead of using the parameters that come with the optimization uh, procedure, we just treat them as parameters on a neural network. And there are neat connections uh, between the fact that these algorithms, either the multiplicative one or the proximal projections, in general combine linear uh, operators and point ones nonlinearities, exactly as neural networks. So the, this idea was initially proposed by uh, Gregor and Lecun, and then uh, myself follow up uh, as well, and, and the Merle group with uh, the deep NMF case. And uh, John took these uh, several steps ahead, uh, considering much more general type of uh, model-based approaches, where we can actually uh, derive architectures that would be hard to come up with using the knowledge that comes from the model-based approaches. So to review, I started from NMF, that is model-based. Then I went to the discriminative case, where we are using the information better, but is hard to train. Or, or it can become hard to train in, in when the data grows. Then we can have neural networks that are inspired in the way these things are solved. And we finally get to deep learning, where we just design the architecture based on other, uh, like we take a uh, standard architecture, and we try to adapt it to our problem. So the question is, in this line, where to stand? The answer, I guess it would depend on how much data you have, like if we have a, or, or how much supervision you have. The less data and the less computational power uh, at training you want to go to the left, and the more you want to go to the right. So uh, the idea is that this, in the deep learning approach, we, this is just purely discriminative. And the idea is we just need to define a, a, a deep generic architecture and train it to maximize performance. And we need to set three ingredients, uh, objective functions, architectures, and which input features uh, we are going to use. So uh, now what I'm going to be doing is just a review of the things that have been done in the literature. Uh, in, in for training deep networks for solving this particular inverse problem. So the first thing is the objective function. And one thing we could do is, uh, the first thing we could do is to say, okay, let's substitute the block that contains the NMF and put a neural network. So let's train it to predict the separation in the short time Fourier transform domain. A more sensible approach that was mentioned before is to say, let's train to predict the masks. And as we know that we are going to be using these masks, and actually having a very good uh, separation in the features in the uh, short time free transform domain is not as important as guessing the mask, right? Uh, this is a more sensible uh, approach. And finally, some, uh, some signal estimation that correlates more with, with what happens in the time domain would be to sort of scale the previous uh, approach and try to give the importance to the different bins 
uh, according to how much energy is in each of them. The, in, in the previous approach, every beam, no matter how much energy we had, would weight the same. Uh, so th there might be other uh, approaches here. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be com uh, complete in, in, this, uh, in this review. So, so in order to talk about the architecture, uh, I, would I would want to have a word on modeling long-term dependencies. And we've heard a, a lot about the LSTMs here today, so I'll talk a bit about that uh, as well. The idea is that we are modeling, we have local models for our signals, but we want to reconstruct lo long uh, temporal signals. So we need a way to impose a local consistency in the model-based approaches. So the most, uh, the, the first way is to do sort of a convolutional version of NMF, where our input is just a set of different frames. But this blows the, the space uh, a lot in the sense that the dimensionality that we are modeling is much larger. Another thing we could do is to try to impose some structure in the codes, such as imposing that the codes do not change much over time or trying to learn the temporal dynamics. Those things were studied in the literature as well. So in the deep learning setting, this thing can be embedded into the architecture either by embedding it in the representation through using multiple frames for context or uh, in the form of recurrency, either generic recurrent neural networks or uh, these long short-term memory networks, the, the LSTMs. So uh, finally, a word on the input features. Most uh, works use time frequency representations of the data, log mail or uh, uh, magnitude STFT. And it has been observed that we need more uh, features in general than in the speech recognition case, which makes sense because we want to do a, a finer estimation. So uh, to recap and motivate the proposed approach, uh, the idea is that what we are doing here is we are transforming the signal into a feature space that uh, has some nice properties. We do the separation then there, and then we solve a phase recovery problem. So this uh, feature space is a local nonlinear transformation that is discarding some, some uninformative uh, uh, variability in the signals and is allowing uh, the, the, what the separation method that comes later to get, do not take care of that and also predicts a more stable representation, giving more, appro giving more approximation power. There's obviously a trade-off between discriminability and invariance, and, we, we don't, and this relates to what I just said regarding the number of features. So what we are going to be exploring here is the following. So we want to consider uh, input features that are invariant to an informative differences at multiple time scales. In a way, the way we can think about this is that we want to integrate the temporal consistency into the representation rather than uh, modeling it directly. Uh, I will, so, we have a paper in ICASP in which we did this for the NMF case, but this I will be talking now here only about the deep learning say. So let me tell you, what, so intuitively what a stable signal representation means is that we want a representation that doesn't change too much if the signal undergoes little deformations. So to give an example, the short time Fourier transform, the magnitude is stable to local translations, but it's unstable to local time warps in the sense that if we change, delay it a little bit, then for example, in this harmonic signal, the higher harmonics can be very different and this will give an, a large L2 between the two representations and will make them hard to model. So, a way to solve this is uh, what we are going to be using here is a constant Q transform based on wavelets that has good frequency and uh, spatial localization. This approximates the very well known uh, male frequency spectrograms. And the, the average modulus of these representations are stable to local time warps. But the, the issue that we face is that let's say we want to model a long temporal context, 
if we average all these things, for example, that row in the time frequency representation, we are losing a, a lot of inf information. So uh, the idea here would be to say, okay, we can maybe average this to get like a, a, a rough estimation of what's going on at a large time scale, but we don't wanna lose in between the detailed information. So the idea would be that we can iterate this thing and try to apply another stable uh, wavelet transform into this uh, second approach. And the goal is to have a representation that would be better and more stable than just sticking together many frames. So this uh, scattering transform by Stefan Mala and his, uh, and his group essentially does this. It's a hierarchy of these wavelets and uh, modulus operators for, with average, averages. And it has been used in many classification tasks very successfully. So uh, given also the talk that we saw at first, we can say, okay, why do we want to learn this? If, uh, sorry, why do, why do we want to use predefined uh, values if we can learn them? And I, I agree to that. So we're going to take inspiration into this representation and we're going to be using a multi-time scale representation that is uh, in a form of a Gaussian pyramid or in a Laplacian pyramid. In, this, in, the, in the sense that in the lower level, we have a high uh, res time resolution representation and in the high, that, that given by the CQT. And in the higher levels, what we are going to have is more uh, uh, the, the same signal, but a different down sample in different temporal uh, resolutions. And the idea is that if we consider a frame there, we are going to, with the same number of parameters, we are going to be looking at a much longer a temporal context than if we use the same number of parameters on solely in the in 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 the high resolution setting and so in this way we're going to be using a good localization for for the short term and also be viewing large scale variability in the input features uh, to to the system and the, the strategy of using multiple scales is also used in image processing uh, or, or, or computer vision tasks where the different the images are fed in different scales to certain convolutional neural networks. So uh, the architecture that we can use sort of goes in this way. We, uh, here the time is uh, vertical. <laughs> Sorry for the switch. So the idea is that we are going to have this input uh, pyramid as an input and we can take one or several frames in this pyramid considering that the pyramid, the, the doing a fixed number of frames at each level increases actually the span uh, at different scales as we go down. And we are used only temporal convolutions for the layers and rectify linear units in between as non-linearities. Since we are going to be using mass prediction, we put a sigmoid at the end to have the outputs be between zero and one. So, let me now go to see some uh, results. Here we used uh, the TIMID data set and we used 64 speakers. We divide them into two groups, uh, male and female. This is sort of an artificial uh, example, but was a first test. And we took uh, 12 different uh, speakers that of course were not used at training, six male and six females. And we uh, consider mixtures of one or the other. So uh, as many, it, it has been reported in many times, the using the non-negative matrix factorization performs worse than the DNN approaches. But uh, so in the first three rows, what we are gonna see is first a DFT, uh, co concatenating five frames of the DFT, then and applying a DNN, concatenating five frames of the CQT and doing a DNN, and then a single frame of this pyramid with five scales. So we have the same number of parameters in all three. And we can see that this gives a boost in performance, um, meaning that the, the, the network is able to get more rich uh, temporal information with this very simple architecture. Also, the use of the CQT seems to be playing a role. I, I will be coming back to that. And, and, and the last row, I, I, we use like also a convolution in this, uh, with this architecture, then this gives a, like a very marginal uh, approach, a very marginal improvement. 
so the other thing that I will uh, talk about is uh, the chime second challenge following the setting that was uh, used by John in the, in the previous talk. And so the idea is that we have a speech embedded in, in noise, it, it, and these mixtures are reverberant. And the, we have seven, about 7,000 clips for training with different SNR conditions. And then there's a development set and a, a test set. And I will be showing uh, two settings. The first is a small scale that I, I use this in order to train many models and, and report many configurations. Uh, that is uh, tested, evaluated in the development set, and the large scale one that uses the whole thing and the parameters are tuned in the development set. So I'm, I'm uh, starting here comparing with uh, to Jonathan's work in uh, the in deep NMF. And uh, although I, the, the system was trained with all the, 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 the signal to noise ratios, I'm just uh, showing the center ones for, for a matter of space. space. Uh, so the first comment is to say that the, so the DNNs are trained with nine frames. And I used here in all these experiments is three scales, maybe using more could be beneficial. And I changed the number of parameters that I used uh, for training each of them. So, and what we see is that it, they, they, there's an improvement in performance here. The comparison with the deep NMF is uh, has to be taken uh, with care because the deep NMF has much fewer trainable parameters, so it's, it's a different uh, approach. But if we compare to the standard DNN using similar amount of parameters, we can get a boost in the performance that is significant. Uh, and, and this is just by modeling properly the temporal input temporal context and the targets, and, and I will talk about this uh, later. So if we go to the large scale, then we face the LSTMs, which is the, the bad guy in this contest. And so first, if we look only at the, we're looking at the development set here. And I, I only trained this, uh, this setting for, for, for this approach. I, I plan to do more rigorous tests later. And this approach, uh, here I'm comparing LSTMs that were trained with mask estimation using STFT features. And it's fair to say that the LSTM uses much uh, fewer parameters than this particular network. But what I want to show is that uh, just having a feed, simple feed forward with the proper features is competitive to this LSTM uh, for now. <laughs> in, the, in, the next, uh, oops, in the next setting, uh, uh, then the LSTMs are better. But the LSTMs are using the, the, um, some MEL features, and they are training with the signal approximation that I will do. But I mean, I have no doubts that the LSTMs are going to perform better, or, or I, I don't want to have this discussion. What, what I'm just trying to, to show is that it is the, the, this method is, is simple and is competitive, and it might be a good idea to, to mix them uh, or, or to add some recurrency to these features. Uh, but, but the important thing is that if we compare to the DNNs, then we are observing as, as a consistent uh, improvement and those two systems are more uh, likely to uh, so are more comparable and I didn't have I don't have the, the results for the bidirectional LSTMs but probably th those would do <laughs> even better okay so I, I want to have now a word on what's the role of the targets so in the in cell separation as John was explaining in his talk there's a lot of information present in the mixture, and predicting, predicting the masks is a great idea. So the masks are a very stable target, meaning that the, the deep neural networks do not need to model the signals completely. They just need to guess where the energy is, which is a much simpler task. But even in this case, uh, and, and the, the results by the L, that LSTM paper verifies it, that using MEL features as targets, so this means that we have a, a more stable representation of the mask, is giving a boost. So estimating the masks there, so, so there, there's something important to say about having stable uh, targets uh, in order to have a, the, um, a, an easier prediction. And with this comment, I want to 
uh, connect this with the other type of inverse problems that I mentioned at the beginning. Because what happens if we do not have the mixture signal? So let's say in the bandwidth extension case or in, in the image super resolution case. And I want to mention a data set that uh, was put together by Gotham uh, this year that is, is very nice. So you, you have speech that is uh, recorded with handheld devices or very bad devices, and we, you have the, the matching uh, produced version of them. So what if we want to match these two things? So there's information in, in, the, in the, our observations uh, sorry, there's information in our targets that is simply not present in the observations. So when we are doing some deep learning approach for solving it, what we are trying to do is we are trying to approximate a mapping that is inherently unstable. What this means is that a given observation and uh, uh, can map to many different points, uh, and, and there's no way of, uh, of doing that, so of, of knowing which one it is. So if we feed to the neural network, each of these examples, and we show the same re low resolution version for them, what will likely happen is that we are going to end up predicting something in the middle that might perceptually not be the best solution. So maybe we would like to predict one of them, disregard of which one the cor is the correct one, just to, to have a good signal of, uh, for them. So uh, the possible strategy then would be maybe here predicting some stable representations of the signals can be a good idea to, uh, instead of mapping them to each of these uh, unstable uh, versions, we would map to a common representation and then have to deal with a phase recovery problem as we do in, uh, in, in the speech enhancement. Of course, the, the problem is that we don't have the mixture phase, but there has been some work on phase recovery recently that is starting to show some it, it, that in some cases uh, there are some theoretical guarantees in order to recover uh, the, the phase under certain properties of what are the... Uh, so so, so it, it, depending on the properties of which uh, linear operators we are using and which pooling we are using. So I talked about image super resolution, so we could explore this idea here. And the state-of-the-art approaches either use patch-based methods or dictionary learning or uh, deep learning. So the, I'm interested in talking about the deep learning version, and the idea is to have a very powerful uh, convolutional neural network, and it's trained to predict the pixel uh, reconstruction. So given the, the small image, we actually uh, enlarge it using, let's say, by cubic interpolation, and then we learn a mapping that goes to, to the pixel domain. And this, although this is unstable uh, and, and has the problems that I mentioned, is a very strong baseline, and it, it beat the other alternatives, because the problem is very hard. But when you look at the results, you can tell that the neural network is uh, producing some blurriness. And so uh, the proposed approach is to train a similar neural network, but instead of using the, as targets the pixel space, we are going to use this uh, multi-scale scattering coefficients. And once we have them, we can use uh, some sort of gradient descent to try to match, uh, to, to, to try to produce an image that matches these coefficients. Of course, we can initialize them sensibly using other type of scaling like the cubic. So the result will not necessarily be better in, or, or will probably be worse in terms of PSNR, but the hope is that we are going to be able to approach. Oops. Well, you can. <laughs> I guess there you go. So, so this is hard to see, and especially with the blurriness of the projector and so on. But so on the top left, we have the, the bicubic uh, reconstruction. This is magnification times three. Then we have the pixel estimation. Uh, in the bottom left, the, what we recover with our uh, uh, reconstruction, and on the bottom right, with the, the, the original signal. So if you look uh, carefully with some loving care, you'll see that we have some structure that is, uh, so especially in the hair, and there's some structure that could be predicted and uh, is uh, so somehow reconstructed. But 
when we solve the phase recovery, is not necessarily put in the in the let's say right position, but is just reconstructed to match the the approach. So uh, to wrap up, I discussed a natural connection that is that we have between model-based approaches and deep learning approaches. Uh, after this uh, discussion, I uh, tried to make a point of that using stable signal representation can play an important role for solving inverse problems, in particular the so, uh, source separation case. I show, I show that we can construct a, a simple feedforward architecture that can compete with more sophisticated and, uh, ar architectures. Then uh, this idea of using stable targets seems to be playing a role even in source separation where we have a lot of side information. And um, I showed a, an example in a more challenging setting where we do not have the, uh, so, so like in, in the image super resolution case. And of course, future lines of research are that now we are using these scattering coefficients as, as targets. Uh, or the CQT in the case of speech enhancement. A nice question is, can we learn this? Like, rather than using predefined settings, can we learn some projections and pooling that keep uh, that that be, be, uh, consist in better targets for for solving this type of inverse problems? So, we, with this, I conclude the talk and thank you very much. Any questions? Um, so I've been learning about like wavelets and the constant Q transform a little bit lately, um, and I think you said that you took the constant Q transform and then took pyramids out of that. Yes. So I have the impression that you can tune the that sort of transform to get different uh, band to do different bandpass filters essentially at, when you do it. So have you considered? Do you think you could put them together so that you do? Uh, get your pyramids in one step. Uh, say it again, sorry. Do you think that you could tune, like, instead of doing um, a low pass filter on your uh -huh, uh -huh. CPT, yeah, or the temporal low pass filter? Yeah, yeah. Instead of doing that, maybe you could just do um, tune the constant Q transform to different bands or something like that as you do it to get each different level out and in one step. Okay, so I, I, I haven't thought about that. Um, I, I'm not. I don't actually know if you can do that with the math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't, I, I don't know either. Uh, it seems to me so. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Have a question? Jujin. Hi. Uh, interesting talks. Uh, I just mentioned a chain of approaches from NMF to discriminative NF and uh, and uh, NMF inspired network. Could yeah. Show the slide, okay? Yeah. Uh, and you said that uh, uh, which approach to use depending on uh, the amount of uh, labeled the data you use. Yes. So actually, in the task, in real case task. Uh, you have a lot of unlabeled mixture data. Since you, you can you can generate artificially uh, labeled mixture data or labeled uh, connected data, but in real world case, what you have is a large amount of unlabeled data. So my question is, how could you deal with a large amount of unlabeled data in the framework of a neural network? Oh, okay, so I think that this is one probably one of the hottest topics of uh, currently in neural networks. And if I had the answer, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. So <laughs> it's, it's, but, it sounds like a... No, but, 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 the, but the question is very, is very appropriate. And, and, I, and I guess that also where to stand in this, in, in this line has to do with the amount of labeled data. I didn't say it, uh, but it's true, labeled data. In the particular problem of uh, source speech enhancement, we can sort of get away with it in the sense that we have many hours of uh, speech recordings and uh, we can artificially generate a lot of mixtures. So, so the sort of the type of supervision that we need there is sort of mild. But um, uh, absolutely, like many works recently are looking on ways of, of, of how to take uh, profit of this. 
and uh, of this unlabeled data. And the, the, for example, people have been looking at learning uh, deep systems that with different losses, I, like, for example, like either creating some artificial surrogate classes of, the diff of, of unlabeled data in order to tra train meaningful features and transfer them to, yeah. to, to the case where we have little uh, data. But, I mean, it's an open question. It's, it's so I'm very interested if you, if you can learn stable representations from unlabeled data. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yo. I have a quick question, maybe not quite really relevant. I'm a little uh, curious about the, the, the timid experiment you did. Uh -huh. So you said it's a gender dependent. So yes. uh, then uh, how do you, so is a uh, is the data only have the female versus male mix? Yes, yes, only female versus male. Oh, I see. I, I, sorry. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We were doing the simple case that John said. That's it? Can I ask one from here on the yeah. cloud? Uh, this is actually the slide I want to ask about. Ah. So, so what do you do here when you have one observation that maps to potentially multiple places in a single space? Yes. I mean, you could run an inference with some kind of sample space. Sure, sure, sure. Here. Sure. So, so, so the, the like the brutal way of doing it would be to not do anything, just learn and and hope for the best. And the the, the funny thing is that this is a very strong baseline to beat, like like. I mean, what I mean is that the, the solution that you get is blurry, but it, it never makes mistakes. In this, sorry, it never, for example, in the super resolution, sometimes it's very, if you add some structure wrongly, it's worse than just blurring it. You know what I mean? I mean, well, then we go to perce perceptual discussion that it might be subjective. But so one way is to just do, don't do anything, what we are, uh, investigating is using these sort of abstract, predicting these stable versions of them, and then solving the inverse problem. But uh, for example, another some other approaches that be, have been studied in the literature uh, are some, for example, these generative networks that say so. The problem here is a, a loss function problem. We we don't know how to measure if the reconstruction is good. So uh, a group in Mont in Mon uh, Benjo's group in Montreal, uh, Ian Goodfellow, and uh, th then follow up by people at Facebook uh, Research. What they did is they said, okay, if we don't want to use L like L2, we, what we can do is, but we do have samples of.